It's the 70s in New York City, and the NYPD is at war with the Mafia. And the Mafia? Well, they were winning. There was crime on every corner of the streets. Bombings, arson, stabbings, shootings, robberies. Wherever there was crimes, you could bet the Mafia was involved. But this wasn't senseless violence. It was about greed, dominance, fear, respect, and most importantly, money. You're Mayor Lenksky, born in 1902. You were born to a Jewish family of immigrants from Belarus, and it'd be an understatement to say life was hard for you growing up as a kid. Being Jewish in Russia was probably the worst thing imaginable for a kid. Your family was dirt poor, having to save up every penny possible just to make sure you wouldn't starve at night. You had no friends your age, and you'd be beaten, shot, stabbed, or worse, all because you were Jewish. All the odds were stacked against you. So your family quickly packed their belongings and immigrated to the United States, where you'd find a new shot at life. So there you are, finding your way through the busy streets of Eastside Manhattan. It was an absolutely mesmerizing place to be. It was as if the city pulsed with the heartbeats of immigrants, each seeking their own American dream. But for you, you had a different type of dream. You didn't want to be the next poor immigrant struggling to put food on the table, another peasant at the bottom of society. No, you'd be the exact opposite of everything you sought to leave behind in Belarus. You made it your mission to be so rich that you'd be the next king of America. And this place would be the beginning of a fortune for you, and you'd do anything to make sure it happened. As a kid, you did whatever you could to fit into the Manhattan mob scene. You'd gamble, rob people, and vandalize property in an attempt to make a name for yourself. But while you were out there, you learned a lot of skills that'd be useful. How to be cunning, how to survive, and more importantly, how to make money. But now, you were a bit older. You've been around the block enough times to know all the tricks. You're no longer that little boy anymore. It was time to step up and join the ranks as a mobster. You were ambitious and always ready to go, but you still knew who to mess with and who not to. You weren't stupid. It was here, in the blur of the New York City lights, that you met Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, your childhood companion. You two were more than friends, you were brothers. You could trust him with your life, and he could trust you with his, and eventually, you two would even begin to make money together. Which is where you'd learn your first lesson in the Mafia Bible to Riches. During the 30s, the United States made it illegal to manufacture, transport, and sell alcoholic beverages. This was intended to reduce crime, solve social problems, and improve health. But instead, it ended up creating a bigger problem than it set out to solve. But you saw this as a golden opportunity to make some serious money for yourself. The government didn't want to sell people alcohol? No problem, you would be the one to do it. And you charged triple the price too. It was a win-win. People got their alcohol, you got your money, and the government got a giant middle finger. So you gathered your mafia brothers, came together, and created a plan to join the lucrative liquor trade. This business was all about smuggling alcohol and selling it secretly to make a boatload of money. And voila, bootlegging was born. The demand for alcohol skyrocketed overnight after being outlawed, making bootlegging a highly profitable business. You had money coming in, clients in the door, and were screwing the government. What more could you ask for? This era saw the rise of notorious mobsters like Al Capone, who made fortunes from the bootlegging operations and the associated violence and corruption that came with controlling the bootlegging market. But now, it was your turn to cash in. First off, you know the game. It's risky, but the payoff is huge. And since the government said alcohol's a no-go, everyone wanted it even more, and you'd be the one to quench their thirst. After you've earned your stripes, you had a mafia network like a spider's web, connecting you with the people who made the alcohol, those who bring it to you, and all the places you'd sell it, called the speakeasies. It's not just about moving bottles, it's about being smart and getting out while you can. Getting the alcohol was key. You'd have friends in other countries who'd send you the good stuff, hiding it in boxes that look boring on the outside. You also knew folks closer to home who'd make it in secret. It wasn't the fanciest, but there was a lot of it. 
moving this alcohol is where you shine. You've got cars that look normal, but are fast and have secret spots to hide the bottles. This way, the alcohol can get to where it needs to go without the police catching on. It's like a game of cat and mouse, but you were always one step ahead. The illegal clubs are where the magic really happens. They look ordinary on the outside, but inside, they're full of life and laughter. People needed to know the secret word to get in. Inside, they could forget about the law and enjoy themselves over a nice cold beer. And you had places like this hidden all across the city. Of course you've always got to watch out for the law. Their job was to catch you, and your job was not to get caught. But you were smart. You've got people watching out, and you're always ready to do what it takes to protect your business. This was your world. You built something huge because you saw a chance when everyone else saw a problem. As long as the law says no to alcohol, you'll be the one there to say yes, making sure people get what they want and you get paid. But your aspirations at becoming filthy rich wouldn't end there. In fact, they'd bring you to the next chapter in the Mafia Bible to Riches. While you were in the streets of Manhattan, mobsters were on every corner, and over time, you were used to the average mafia activity, but one day, your life would change. You were minding your business, walking home from school, when you were approached by an older mafia teen, Lucky Luciano. He attempted to extort you for protection money, but you didn't flinch. There was a fire in you, a defiance that earned his respect. It was a confrontation turned companionship, and together, it marked the beginning of an organized crime syndicate that would make you rich beyond your wildest dreams. It was 1929, and Lucky Luciano had the dream to create his own criminal organization. He gathered some of his most trusted people, and together, you, Lucky Luciano, Johnny Torrio, and Frank Costello all came together to form the Italian, Irish, and Jewish Mafia. So in your first move after creating the new syndicate, you knew you needed a way to get the bootlegging and blood money from the streets off your hands and get all new clean cash to start your new business venture. The first thing you'd need to do is move your money around to make it look more legit. You can't just walk into the bank and deposit large sums of illegal money because who wants to deal with those pesky federal agents asking you all sorts of questions about the source of your funds? So how would you do it? Luckily for you, your friends in Switzerland have been taking advantage of the convenient Swiss secrecy law in 1934, which made it illegal to disclose information on Swiss banking clients. The Swiss banks knew you were laundering money, but who cared? They made their money, and so did you. Bingo! This was your ticket to constructing your gambling empire. And your first strategy? You were jumping straight into the belly of the beast, the Sin City itself, Las Vegas. You see, at the time, another massive opportunity had presented itself. Like you had learned in Chapter 1, it was very profitable to defy the government. But alcohol wasn't the only thing the United States banned in the 1920s. The US government also banned gambling, stripping another pleasure from the activities of everyday Americans. People were restless, bored, and downright angry. That is, until the state of Nevada legalized gambling in 1931. Back when Nevada said yes to gambling, big shot mobsters like Al Capone shrugged it off. Las Vegas? They all thought it was just a speck of dirt with a couple small places to play slot machines, not somewhere you'd want to hang your hat. But things would change pretty quickly. When the war wrapped up, you, your pals, and Siegel all saw what everyone else missed, a desert diamond in the rough. With Cuba as the only other gambling landmark, when that door shut with Castro's revolution, you realized Vegas could be the next big thing for American tourists craving more dice rolling action. Siegel, with a head full of dreams and pockets backed by Mafia Cash, kicks things off. He sets up the Flamingo, the first luxury betting palace, opening its doors at the end of 46, but he had a rough start and tried to scale operations too early with not enough buzz, leading Siegel to help himself to the project money that was intended for the start of the casino. When the bosses found out, they weren't happy. Siegel's big gamble on the Flamingo was the last bet of his life, and it's safe to say, it was a bust. 
But you didn't let the dream die. You took over, saw where Siegel made his mistakes, reconstructed the business, and boom, the Flamingos started making cash hand over fist. Suddenly, Las Vegas was the place to be, and money was rolling in. And as the man in charge of the money, you had a clever setup to make sure you'd make good money off your casinos, even if you had to play dirty. First up, you've got what's called the rake. Think of it like a small player's fee for each hand or an hourly charge for sitting at the table. You're providing a safe spot and a dealer who's secretly playing the customers, not just dealing the cards. Unlike how legit places do it, it's your bread and butter. Now in most spots, folks playing poker at home is fine by the law, but as long as the house isn't taking a cut of the action. But it was your casino. You're earning and taking a slice off of everyone's plate. Next, there's the art of the deal. Your deal. You've got dealers who know how to handle the cards in a way that's not exactly fair. They're skilled making sure certain players, your mafia guys, end up winning. These players are in on the game, handing over their winnings back to you. And it was just about control and making sure the working man loses and the house always wins. Then you've got the side hustle of loaning money. Say a player's run out of luck and cash, you're right there, ready to lend them whatever they need to keep playing. At a sky high interest rate, of course. This way, you're not just making money on the game, you're also earning from the loans they're taking out to stay in the game. It was a steady stream of income coming from their hope to win big. And lastly, let's talk about making sure winners don't get too lucky. If someone was winning too much and they're not one of your guys, you might arrange a little accident for their winnings. But you don't do this too often. If word gets around, players start thinking your game's not safe and they'll stop coming. And no players means no game. And no game means no money. Fast forward a bit, and now you've got the Chicago and New York family setting up shop too. Stardust, Desert Inn, Riviera, big names pulling in big crowds. And by the 60s, Vegas was the promised land for anyone looking for a good time and a chance to win big. Sure, more players meant slicing the pie more ways than one, but you were smart. All the families got a piece of each other's actions. So when one place hit the jackpot, everyone got a cut. But eventually, after the feds had caught on to how you were running your casino, lawyers made everything tangled up. Nobody could tell who owned what anymore, and it didn't matter. There was nothing for anyone to make money in Las Vegas anymore. But regardless, it goes to say you made an absolute fortune inside of Vegas. Vegas became your playground, a dazzling jewel in the desert, where the whole world came to play, and you and your friends held all the cards. And you'd do this not only in Vegas, but all across the world. At the peak of your reign, you had casinos in Vegas. And now, you'd open shop in Cuba. It's 1952, and you've already established yourself in Vegas. Now you're eyeing Cuba. The place has potential. A tropical paradise begging for high-stakes gambling to make a big comeback. But you ran into a problem. The current president isn't playing ball. So what do you do? You find a way to bring back the guy who will, Batista. You offer a nice little incentive, say a quarter of a million dollars, to the current guy to take a hike so your man Batista can take over. Smooth, right? Now Batista's in charge thanks to you. He owes you one big time, so you strike a deal. You'll be the behind the scenes gambling czar for a cool annual salary of $25,000. In return, you help get the gambling scene in Cuba back to its former glory. But you're thinking bigger than just getting things back to how they were. That just wasn't enough control. You needed one more layer to ensure you'd make a profit when deals were made. So Batista changed the laws in a way that was music to your ears. Want to open a casino? Sure, just invest $1 million to open a casino. Or you could invest $200,000 on a new nightclub or hotel that I own, and bam, you've got yourself a gaming license. This opened the door wide open for investments, making Cuba a magnet for high rollers and big spenders all over. All the while giving you a quiet monopoly on Cuba's gambling scene. In simple terms, you've turned Cuba into a gambling paradise all under your control. You were running the show. You were pulling the strings of the entire operations, setting the stage for a golden age of gambling that puts Cuba on the map. You've got casinos, nightclubs, and luxury hotels, all lining your pockets and solidifying your status as the boss of all bosses in the gambling world.
You also had another key business tactic you used to make and keep your money. You're a mastermind with a network that reaches into the darkest corners of power. When you rise to high places, naturally you get friends in high places and it was only a matter of time before you were the puppet master pulling the strings of any target of your choice. So now, instead of being on the run from law enforcement, you turned the tables and now you had law enforcement lined in your sights. It seems that law enforcement didn't quite get the memo. They thought because they were law enforcement that they were safe, but they wanted to take everything you'd worked in the last 25 years. Your friends, your family, your money, they threatened all of it. Which now meant it was game on and they weren't safe either. And after some digging with the help of your friend, Frank Costello, you found yourself in possession of some very compromising photos of J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI at the time. These weren't just any photos, they showed Hoover in sexual situations he would never want the public to see. With these photos, you had leverage over one of the most powerful men in America. The way you got these photos was no accident either. They came from exclusive parties where the elite and powerful would go to let their guard down. And you used these events to gather secrets to get Hoover to completely deny that the Mafia was even doing anything illegal. With this dirt on Hoover, you could operate criminal activities with a sort of safety net. Hoover, who was normally untouchable and went after businessmen like you, now had to tread carefully. This had solidified you as someone to be feared, respected, and not to be messed with. You would influence over important figures from politicians to judges. You had them all in your pocket because you knew their secrets. Despite being watched by the FBI, you were never caught. And people wonder to this day how you managed this. But the answer lies in the secrets you held and the pages you took from the Mafia's Bible to Riches. Your story is about more than just crime. It's a lesson in how ambition and the search for power can sometimes lead you down a dark path. It shows that the world of crime and power is complex, and sometimes to understand it, we need to look beyond the surface. Thank you for watching The Dark Side of Dollars, and remember, the truth is in the details.